I remember once doing a Q&A session with some young people, and the question was asked about whether or not it was appropriate to dress in a feminine sort of way. In response to which I basically said, not just yes, but absolutely so. And so the whole idea is that women collectively, they're meant to portray to the world the beauty of the feminine person, intellectually, spiritually, physically, as a means of giving glory to God. And funny enough, one of the best passages in the gospel to illustrate this particular point is found in the gospel of Matthew chapter 22, where the Lord talks about whether or not it's appropriate to pay taxes. So as a matter of background, in the context of this particular passage, two categories of people, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they go up to Christ and they ask him whether or not it's appropriate to pay taxes to the emperor. And obviously it's a trap, right? And so if the Lord answers yes, it seems like he's siding with the emperor over and above the Israelite people. But if he says no, it seems like he's stirring up a rebellion. And so instead of responding to what seems to be a binary option, the Lord creates a third option. And so first of all, he invites these people to produce a coin. And then he asks them basically what image is on this coin. And they have to say, of course, the image of the emperor. In response to which he has that really famous line, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Now, just to be clear, this particular passage isn't simply an exhortation to pay taxes, even though it's true that you should pay your taxes. And it's also not meant primarily to address the question of church versus state. But instead, this particular gospel is meant to address specifically the issue of Christian iconography. And we know that because in referring to this image of the emperor on the coin, the Lord is making a not so subtle allusion to the book of Genesis, specifically this notion that we are made in the image and likeness of God which speaks to the fact that every single human person who ever walked the face of the earth bears in their very soul the image of the one living and true God. You know, to further expound upon this particular point, I want to refer heavily to the ideas and writings of Christopher West for the remainder of this reflection. And so as a starting point, going back to the book of Genesis, we hear that God is good, and we hear that on top of that, he's the creator of all things. And what this means, practically speaking, is that everything that is created is not simply good, but everything that is created is meant to be an icon of some aspect of God's heart. And what's more, again, in the book of Genesis, we hear that before the fall, before the advent of original sin, Adam and Eve are naked and unafraid. And also we hear that the human person is very good as opposed to every other created thing, which is simply good. Which speaks to the fact that men and women together, vulnerable but secure in being loved, form collectively the most powerful icon of the one living and true God. But you see, here's where the devil comes in, right? Because what the devil does is that he takes these beautiful things, which are meant, again, to be icons, windows, if you will, leading us to the invisible God, and he turns them into idols, such that we become mesmerized by the windows themselves and basically stop there, instead of using these things again to lead us to rest in the divine life. In other words, the devil takes the beautiful things in this world, which again are meant to awaken this desire for God in our hearts and lead us back to God, and convinces us somehow that these things themselves are meant to fulfill the deep longings in our hearts. And Christopher West goes on to say that this particular move, this fundamental shift from icon to idolatry, is in a certain sense the source of all human dysfunction in the world today. Now obviously this kind of begs the question, what's the way forward? What's the way out, if you will? Well, obviously, it's not the go the way of addiction or self-indulgence. But funny enough, it's also not the go the way of stoicism in the sense of running away from or otherwise discarding the beautiful things in this world. And so even though there remains an enduring value when it comes to asceticism, this practice of taming the wild heart by going the way of fasting or avoiding occasions of sin, at the same time, the real solution, if you will, is to go back to this notion of no in favor or greater yes. And so no to idolatry, no to objectification, no to sin, obviously, but yes to restoration. Yes to a restoration of the original iconography of the beautiful things in this world. In other words, all of us as a Christian people are meant to bear the collective responsibility of restoring this notion that the beautiful things in this world are meant to ultimately lead us to rest in the one living and true God. To further illustrate this point, I want to draw upon this example from the life of Christopher West. And so basically, as Christopher West tells the story, back in the day when he was a young man, he used to go to the local mall and simply stare at this poster of Chrissy Brinkley, who was a really famous model at the time. But then funny enough, later on, when he became an adult, this particular experience was brought back to him in prayer by the Lord. And so the Lord was basically using this prayer experience to teach Christopher West what he was ultimately looking for back in the day as a young man by looking at this poster. And so as a starting point, the Lord made it clear to him that Chrissy Brinkley's body wasn't bad in itself. And to think otherwise was basically to fall into the heresy of Manichaeism. 
this ancient heresy which basically stipulates that the spirit is good and the material, especially the human body, is bad. But more to the point, in the context of this prayer experience, the Lord was basically inviting Christopher West to restore the iconography of Christy Brinkley, to stop treating her as an idol or an object to be used for one's personal pleasure, but instead to see how Christy Brinkley is meant to be an example of how women in their beauty are meant to lead us to rest ultimately in the divine mystery. Okay, one final example, and I'll kind of end with this. And this example is a story of the prodigal son, which of course you find in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. And so as sort of a quick recap, there's this father who's emblematic of God, and he has two sons, one's younger, one's older. The younger son goes to him at the beginning of the story and says to him, Father, give me the share of the property owed unto me. And then he promptly goes off and loses his share of the property in loose living of prostitutes and whatnot. But then, of course, in the aftermath of him becoming broke, he remembers that his father has a lot of money. And so he goes back to his father, not so much because he's sorry, but because he's thinking about his stomach. In response to which the father celebrates. And so he throws a big party, kills a fatted calf, and invites everyone to celebrate the return of his son, including the elder son, who refuses to come. And of course, what the elder son says is, look, I have slaved for you all these years, and you've never given me and my friends even a young goat to celebrate with. But now you kill a fatted calf for the son of yours. And so, again, he refuses to go and join in the party. Now, as the story applies to what we're talking about today, the younger son, in a certain sense, represents the addict, the one who has gone the way of self-indulgence. And of course, that's precisely what you see in the context of the story. And so if you go back to the beginning of the story, his hunger, in a certain sense, drives him away from the father because he doesn't ultimately trust that his father can ultimately satisfy his hunger. But then, of course, what brings him back is the same hunger, right? And so he goes back because of his stomach as opposed to, again, because of his deep sorrow for having offended his father. We you compare that now to the elder son, who in a certain sense represents the Stoic. And so here's a guy who has followed all the rules, he's stayed at home with his father, but in a certain sense he's forgotten the whole point of the game. He's forgotten that the whole point of the game is to share in God's blessed life, and everything that implies. Freedom, joy, happiness, peace, all the deep longings of the human heart. And so as a result, he's reduced the Christian life to a certain legalism, simply following rules in an abstract sort of way, all the while being immensely angry and refusing to go to the party, which of course is emblematic of the joys of the heavenly kingdom. And you see, that's why St. Augustine has this really interesting quote, whereby he basically says that those who are lost in their passions are less lost than those who have lost their passions, because the former, as opposed to the latter, they haven't lost their sense of hunger. Which speaks to the fact that at the end of the day, the divine invitation is not to go the way of addiction, it's not to go the way of stoicism, but instead it's to do two things, to stay hungry, but at the same time to stay honest, to keep on searching until you find that which ultimately satisfies, mindful of the fact that what we hear precisely in the gospel is that the one who searches will ultimately find, and the one who knocks, ultimately the door will be open to that person, until eventually you come to discover in time, not simply intellectually, but through your own personal experience, that in the words of St. Augustine, and truly the human heart is restless until it rests in the Lord. And you see, when that happens, when you come to be naked and unafraid before the Lord our God, and you realize in retrospect that all this time you were always seen and known and loved, you will truly come to love and appreciate and cherish all the beautiful things in this world for what they truly are, icons as opposed to idols. And what's more, you yourself will ultimately become the thing you were always meant to be, this luminous and radiant icon of the invisible God. And may God bless you all.